Okay, welcome back. So, um, having discussed the advantages of using the random forest over a single tree, let's uh, go over in some more detail uh, how to run the random forest themselves. So, we're going to do uh, two things now. First is we're going to look at the command to actually estimate the random forest model and look to see what options we have within that command. And then finally, we'll discuss the concept of bagging, which is what's used to randomly generate these trees. And as you'll see, we can control this bagging process within the options of the command. Okay, so let's go back to uh, our studio over here. And, um, okay, so Okay, so the command to fit a random forest model, we actually did this once before. Um, you'll recall that um, very briefly, we used this model and we, we ran some predictions with it on the home price data, uh, just to show that it wasn't too much harder than just fitting a regular old uh, regression. And that's true, it's not, okay? So here I have the command to uh, fit a random forest model, model underscore RF, equals random forest, that's the name of the command. And then here you see I give it a formula containing the dependent variable and then the independent variable separated by plus signs. Okay, just like with the regression, I tell it to use the training set. And then I say, and, and this is a part that um, we didn't need to do with the regression, but um, we need to tell it to ignore missing values. Okay, so that's why I have this na action equals na dot omit. As it turns out, in our data, like for example, if I look at our training set here, you can see that um, we have most of the data, but for a few of the passengers, the age is missing. Um, maybe the passenger chose not to, uh, not to state their age when they were buying the ticket. Okay? So for some passengers, we don't have the age. And if you just uh, run the model and there are these missing values, um, it's going to throw an error. So that's why we have to tell it uh, so... Basically, if it encounters a missing value, to basically just omit that observation. Okay. So if I do this and I run this command, um, then I'm going to train up my random forest. And you can see this uh, mod underscore random forest is now in my memory. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. One other difference. Um, notice that for the previous uh, commands, for our part and for the regression, we were using the survival dummy, okay? So let's just have a look at our data. So we have this survival dummy, 0, 1, and then we actually have the, the text variable, the factor variable, whether you survived yes or no. Um, so the way that this command is set up is if you give it a numeric dependent variable, it's going to default into regression mode. But here we want it to be in classification mode, because our dependent variable is a categorical variable. So that's why I pointed at, at the original survived variable, which we converted into a factor instead of um, the survived dummy variable. Okay, so, but as, essentially, aside from those small differences, this is very much the same command that we've been working with. Okay, so now that we fit this model, you, so you can see that, okay, so now I fit this model. Um, Okay, so what, what can I do with this? Uh, well, I can use it to make predictions. We're going to do that next, uh, next class and in your homework. Um, but there are, there are a couple of other things I can do with it. You'll recall that if I, if, I, um, if I do summary on a regression model, okay, like on this OLS model that we had before, if I, if I call summary on that, it will give me a table that gives me my coefficients, um, and these represent the effect of each independent variable. Okay, so I wonder if I can, if we can do that for the random forest model. So let's try the summary command. And you see, uh, so we, it, it does run, it does work, and it does give us some information. But unfortunately, <laughs> what it gives us here isn't quite as informative as what we had in this table. Um, here, we don't see a table of the importance uh, or the marginal effect of each variable. All we see is a big list of parameters that basically tells us the options that the computer used to fit the model itself. 
Okay, so this running summary on this isn't really all that useful. It just tells you what options were used. <laughs> okay. Now, um, the same thing goes with the plot function. Okay, you would figure that if I call plot on this random forest model we just fit, it would give us some representation of the forest itself. But unfortunately, it doesn't do that. It does something quite different. So let me run this. And you'll see that what I get is this kind of funky looking graph, okay, that plots error on the vertical axis and trees on the horizontal axis. So what this is showing you is it's showing you how the overall accuracy of the model changed as the computer added more and more trees to the forest. Okay, so this is sort of the average error, and then these are 95% confidence intervals here above and below. Um, what you basically will see most of the time is that, okay, the error is going to be higher when you use fewer trees. Okay, that kind of makes sense. And as you add more trees, the error will decrease. However, um, it's sort of like diminishing returns. Um, once you get to, you know, a couple of hundred trees, usually speaking, um, the error doesn't keep going down. It kind of levels off or plateaus. Okay. This, uh, this phenomenon where we sort of, there are diminishing returns to adding more trees or adding more of whatever to our machine learning model. Um, later when we're doing artificial neural networks, we'll see what happens as we add more neurons. Um, this, this pattern will, will sort of come up over and over again. Okay, okay so finally, uh, let's look at this last command, because here's the thing. This random forest that we just trained, in theory, contains many, many decision trees. That's what it's comprised of. That's why it's called a random forest. So it ought to be possible for me to see one of those trees, right? Turns out I can sort of do that. Okay, so if I run this command here, this shows me one of the trees. Unfortunately, in this particular package, it, it can't draw the trees in that nice graphical form that I showed you guys last time. Um, if you want to do that, you it, it's kind of a little bit more complicated. You have to use a different package. Um, Come see me in office hours if you really want to know how to do that, okay? But this package can still show us the trees. It just can't draw them in that really nice-looking way. So you can see here, this shows me the first tree out of the 500 that, that I've trained. Okay, so uh, now you go, how is this a tree? Well, it, okay, so the way it works, right, is that, so this is the first node, okay? And then the first node, you can see, splits into two subsequent nodes, nodes two and three. And then I can look up each of those nodes. For example, if I look at the third node, that splits into nodes six and seven. And then I can look up the seventh node, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. If there's a zero here, that just means that it is a terminal node. Okay. And you can see at each node, I have a left and a right. And then I have a split variable. There are three variables in our regression, so this tells me which one of those variables it used to split the data set. And then it tells me the split point, okay? At what value do I want to split the data set? Okay, so this, this table, I know it doesn't look like a tree, but this is one of the trees in our forest. And if I choose a different value here, so I call get tree on mod RF, if I choose, like for example, you know, the 290 or the 199th tree, you can see that, okay, this shows me the 199th tree and what it looks like. You can see this tree actually is, is quite a bit more complicated than the first tree. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so then finally, um, let me uh, discuss the options that we can put into this model. When I fit this model before, okay, I didn't specify any options which means that all of these different options that actually exist were just kept at their default values. Okay, but let's, uh, let's see what options there are. So I'm actually, gonna, I'm actually gonna type into the console here, question mark, random forest. Okay, and that'll help pull up the help information for this uh, command. I, now I know it's, 
Unfortunately, there's no way uh, that I can tell to expand the size of this window. So um, just look at it on your own screen, okay? And what, you, what you'll see here is, is there's all these different options. These are sort of the hyperparameters of the random forest model. And we can adjust these and tweak them to potentially um, optimize the model or make it a little bit more accurate. Um, so now you can see there's a big list of different options here, but I want to draw your attention to four of them. Okay. Number one is this end tree option that determines the number of trees in the forest. So if I want to specify this, what I would do is I would go back up here and I would say end tree equal to, and I would set that equal to a particular value. So the default is 500, but suppose I only wanted to train five trees for some reason. Well, I could do that, okay? And you can see here, okay, I do that, and then I would train only five trees. Um, now, if I wanted to look at them, okay, I could use this get tree command. So I could look at the first tree, and I could look at the fifth tree. But then if I try to look at tree number six, you see it gives me the error because there's only five trees in the forest. Okay, so that's the, that's the, and trees option. Yeah. Um, the next option that I want to discuss is the node size. Okay. Um, and this is similar to the men bucket option that we saw in our part when we were training the individual decision trees. So um, a higher value for the node size leads to uh, smaller, less complicated trees. Okay, so it's kind of the opposite. The bigger you set the node size, the less complicated the trees will be. Okay. Um, and again, you would specify this by simply setting node size equal to and then a particular value, like 30. Okay. Um, okay, the sample size and m try, the number of variables to choose at each split point or to try each split point. Um, these require a little bit more explanation. So um, let me discuss what these two parameters actually do. Um, I'm going to go back to my slides here. Okay. So um, to understand what those two parameters, the sample size and the M try option do, um, we need to understand how the different trees within our forest are constructed. Okay. And they're constructed using a process known as bagging. Now I'm not actually a huge fan of this term because I think the term bagging is, is kind of, it's not very intuitive. Okay, it, it makes it sound more complicated than it is. Okay, um, I think a, maybe a better term would just be like sampling or like random selection or something like that. Okay, because okay, here's 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 how it works. Recall that earlier, okay, in in one of the earlier videos, we saw that when we chose different observations to go into the training set, we ended up training different trees. Okay, and that's exactly what bagging is. Okay, so now, so we're giving the random forest model our training set. Okay, so in some sense, it's already been bagged because we selected some random points to go into this training set and not others. But the, the random forest doesn't know that. It just takes the training set and then it builds the forest. But when it builds the forest, what it's going to do is it's going to select sort of another training set. It's going to select a subset of the observations within the training set to use for each tree. Okay, so our training set has something like 600 observations. Okay, so for the first bag, it's going to choose a subset of those observations. Then for the second bag, it's going to choose a different subset, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's going to create a whole bunch of mini data sets with a smaller portion of our training data. And then it's going to build each tree only off of that smaller subset. Okay. Now the size of these subsets is determined by this value, uh, that parameter that we were talking about, the sample size. Okay. So if our entire training set is 600 observations, 
then perhaps each bag will contain only 300 observations. Okay, in that case, you would set the sample size equal to 300 if you wanted that. Now, if you set the sample size equal to the number of observations in the entire training set, then obviously it's just going to select every single point, which will make each bag exactly the same. Generally speaking, you don't want that because you want the trees that you're growing to each be different. Okay. Finally, this bagging process, this random selection process, we do it not only for the observations when we train each tree, but we also do it for the independent variables themselves. Okay. So in this model that, we're, that we've been training, there are three independent variables, sex, age, and passenger class. Okay. Now, when we train a decision tree, not the whole forest, but just an individual decision tree like we were doing last time, you'll recall that the computer sort of goes through an iterative process where it selects which variable to use at a given node, right? And it, it does this based on some criteria, right? So, for example, you'll recall this is a slide from uh, a couple of lectures ago. So the computer is thinking to itself, okay, I'm making my first split. What variable do I want to split on first? Do I want to split on age, sex, or uh, passenger class? Well, it goes through and it tries all three of them. And it basically figures out, well, which one is the best one to use? Okay, which one is sort of most effective at separating survivors and non-survivors? Whatever one that is, that's the one it's going to use. Okay, so out of three candidate, three candidate individual, I'm sorry, out of three candidate independent variables, it's going to choose one. Okay, now when we build the random forest, it's going to do something slightly different. Okay, instead of choosing from the set of all independent variables at each node, it's going to randomly select a subset of those independent variables it can potentially use. Okay, so for example, at the first node, instead of considering all three independent variables as potential candidates for the one to use, it might only choose from two out of the three. It might only choose, okay, I'm just going to choose between sex and passenger class. I'm not even going to look at it. Okay, and it's going to do that for each node. Okay, now in our example, since we only have three independent variables, this won't make that much of a difference. Okay, but imagine you had a, a more complicated model that had a dozen independent variables. Well, then you could tell it, okay, so at each node, don't consider all 12 of them, only consider a random five of them, or, you know, or, or a random 10 of them. Or, or however much you specify, okay? And that is actually what this m try variable does, okay? This m try option, uh, let me go back to the code real quick. This m try option um, is the number of variables to consider as candidates going into each split point, okay? So, um, the maximum this can be is, of course, the total number of variables, of independent variables in, in your data, which in this case is three. Okay. Um, okay. So <laughs> now you, you might be asking yourself, well, you know, what is, that seems kind of unnecessarily complicated. Like, what, what is the point of, of doing all of this, right, of randomly selecting the data, bagging the data, and then even bagging which independent variables we're going to consider at each node? Well, the answer is, I'm, I'll, I'll use sort of a, a metaphor, okay? So um, there's a lot of uh, studies in the behavioral economics literature that look at group dynamics. And people have tried to study, well, what types of groups tend to make better decisions, okay? And a lot of the studies... Um, have basically concluded that, typically speaking, more diverse groups tend to make 
better decisions. Okay, um, and it, it could be any form of diversity: diversity in age, diversity in gender, diversity in race or ethnicity, diverse just general like diversity in like background and personality. The more diverse your group is, often the better decisions they make. Okay. And you might be, you know, that, that might be kind of a, of a surprise, right? Because you might think, if I have a more diverse group, well, isn't it going to be harder to reach a decision, you know? And the answer is, yeah, it might be harder. There might be more conflict within the group, okay? But the thing is, because, you know, you have that range of different opinions within the group, it means that each person's individual biases are likely to be counterbalanced by somebody else in the group, okay? So I might, you know, have one particular bias this way, but then somebody has the opposite bias, and then, you know, by sort of compromising, we're gonna we're gonna come to some middle conclusion that would be more accurate than if, you know, either you or me uh, individually had made that decision, okay? So the point is, um, in a lot of these sorts of decision-making processes, having a range of different opinions is better. So in the same way, bagging, okay, both forms of bagging, bagging the individual observations that we're going to use to build each tree, and then bagging the independent variables, or randomly selecting which independent variables to consider at each node, it ensures that every tree in the forest is going to be pretty different from each other, okay? We don't want, I mean, we don't want every tree in the forest to be the same, otherwise we, we could just use a single tree. Right? And so, okay, so that's the purpose of this bagging, to basically ensure that the trees in the forest are all quite different, are quite diverse, so then when we use the average of all of their predictions, that final average is going to reflect that diversity of different viewpoints, and it's going to be more accurate than if all the trees were pretty much the same. Okay. Um, I hope that makes sense. That was probably the, the longest out of these videos, okay? But that should give you a basic overview of, you know, um, how to use this model and, and give you a general sense of how it works. Okay, so the final video um, is going to be your homework, and um, I'm going to describe uh, what I want you guys to do for homework in a little bit.